All right. Shalom, everyone. We are getting back into truth and lies about um, the Jehovah's Witness cult. This is the next chapter um, in the book that I uh, started uh, doing videos as as I'm reading through this. I've already started to, um, you know, copy and paste uh, all of the links, at least on, on this page. And as long as I don't run out of uh, description room, in the description, I will be able to give you all of these links. Okay, here we go. This generation will by no means pass away. Now, this brings us on to the prophecies of the end since that day, let alone the failed prophecies made by Bible students from the IBSA before the state of 1914. Let us remember 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Okay, let's go there really fast, okay? 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, and that uh, and that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Okay. It might be so. We need another 90 years to play with, guys. Have your BS meter at the ready. And I think we all know what uh, BS stands for, okay? Okay, so the JW.org from their September broadcast, I'll have this link for you. The GB, I think we got away with that one. Block, yes, new light, how blessed are we? Okay, WBTS failed predictions. Simply, they point to a scripture in Proverbs where it states as, we approach the end of light gets bright, uh, where it states as, we approach the end, the light gets brighter. Hence, every time a thought, edict, rule, declaration is changed, it just it's just simply put as new light. What a get out clause. If they are the direct channel for God, would you not think that the information being given would be ever so slightly clearer in the first place. Here's a new thought. Why not just read the Bible and stop trying to interpret it through man's eyes? Just a revolutionary idea. Okay, so I'll have these links for you as well. Of course, the standard statement here from WBTS Corporation would would be that the light gets brighter. This is a famous Fred Franz speech on 1975 proclamation. So let's assume that these prophecies do not constitute false prophecies. Madly assume whilst remember 1 Corinthians 4, 6 and taking into account Matthew 7, 15 through 20. And also remembering that according to the testimony that Jeffrey Jackson gave at the Australian Royal Commission, and I've also got this link in there for you guys. Is it possible for any other person, body, or organization to have the light get brighter, meaning that there are other people, bodies, organizations, churches, chapels, synagogues, mosques, for which the light can get brighter? Could it be one of these organizations? Now, this is uh, Watchtower Society International Bible Students. This is uh, Layman's Home, a missionary movement, Associated Bible Students. Jehovah's Witnesses Watchtower Society, free Bible students, okay? You've got the first schism, 1909, second schism, 1916 and 1919, and then the third schism, 1928 and 1931. Let's just save the argument here and accept that the WBTS Corporation will not accept any of the above arguments and ignore the information and facts based upon their own publications and secular testimony, as well as their own GB testimony. Okay? Okay. 1918, Christ appoints his faithful and discreet slave. Now, we were taught for many decades that in 1919, Christ appointed the governing body over all of Christ's belongings pertaining to Russell, then Rutherford, then Knorr. This document proves that If that were the case, the violent split that took place between the remaining directors after Russell's passing away and Rutherford's trying to erase him from all history of Jehovah's Witnesses 
would mean that the IBSA would be the faithful and discreet slave. Lies, 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 and yet more lies. Okay. Now, what this says up here is uh, York City Temple and that the temple has now passed out of the hands of the society on account of the lack of funds. Do you know that the society no longer represents Brother Russell's idea of rejecting the work? Do you know that on the morning after Brother Russell's death, Brother Macmillan assumed to direct that uh, Anglo... Okay, um, that got caught, that got cut off. Okay. Now, what this says down here, it says, do you think that the president, either alone or controlling a subservient board of directors of the society or as president of the people's pulpit association, which he claims to have absolute authority over for life, should be permitted to say who shall be pilgrims and so make the church and the three corporations, um, meaning the Watchtower Society, the People's Pulpit Association, and the International Bible Students Association, a one-mind proposition. As you said, the society is in his siftings. Number one, and that mind, his mind, honestly, now, do you think so? Okay. Um, Do you know that one who has plunged the Lord's people into present confusion in so short a time after his election is unfit for the presidency? Okay. Now, even with that Uh, conclusive proof, let's look a little deeper. So for some 90 years, how we rejoiced at Christ's appointment. Turns out this wasn't true, as we can see from Study Edition WT, July 2013, page 8, paragraph 19. In review, what have we learned? In the beginning of this article, we raised three win questions. We first consider that the Great Tribulation did not begin in 1914, but will start when the United Nations attacks Babylon the Great. Then we reviewed why Jesus' judgment of the sheep and the goats did not begin in 1914, but will occur during the Great Tribulation. Finally, we examined why Jesus' arrival to appoint the faithful slave over all his belongings did not occur in 1919, but will take place during the Great Tribulation. Two questions for me, setting aside that according to the GB, it was only the the domestics they were appointed with in 1919. Number one, what type of appointment was this if Christ did not appoint them to look after all his belongings in 1919? Number two, how do you think Christ felt having all his belongings taken away from him in 1919 or another word for it could be stolen? In answer to point one, it It was a mandate, self-appointment. It did not come from Jehovah, Jesus Christ, or his Holy Spirit. Yet again, through deceitful practices, they, within one paragraph, gave Christ back all his belongings without even an apology to Christ and instead accepted the domestics. In referring directly back to the Australian Royal Commission, hopefully it is rather obvious that the governing body chooses itself or is self-appointed. But according to Watchtower literature, the governing body is not appointed by any man. It is appointed by the same one who appointed the 12 apostles in the first century CE, namely Jesus Christ, the head of the true Christian congregation and the Lord and master of the faithful and discreet slave class. Interestingly, however, nowhere in his testimony did Jeffrey Jackson even try to claim that Jesus appoints the governing body members. Early on in the questioning, Agnes Stewart asked, and is it the case that the governing body then appoints new members of the governing body? This would have been the perfect opportunity for Jackson to give a rambling theological lecture to the effect that Jesus is actually the one who does the appointing. Instead, we got a straightforward, that is correct, in other words, not Jesus. Thinking witnesses would do well to ask themselves, if the governing body is self-appointed, how does it differ in any meaningful sense from the leaders of other religions? 
For where does the governing body receive its mandate to lead God's organization if the appointments are openly and unashamedly made by men? The actual calculation of 1914. As stated previously, according to WBTS Corporation, Jesus was looking for his faithful servants around the time of 1875 onwards. And as the WBTS Corporation stated, thus searching and using the WT journals were seen by Christ as giving the food at the proper time. Let us review review the calculation made by Russell, the ex-clothing manufacturer. And as per the ever-changing doctrine, we see an original calculation and, and within 20 years, because it had not come true, miraculously, another calculation was sent from Christ. I mean, it's like Christ doesn't get it right the first time, and he's supposed to be God, right? Well, of course, they throw out the uh, doctrine of the Trinity, so no, Christ would not be God, according to to the Jehovah's Witnesses. To coin a well-used phrase of the WBTS Corporation, we have conclusive proof of a false prophet. Okay, he believed that the sign of Egypt was related to the dimension of the Pyramid of Giza. In the early 1900s, he went to to Europe to measure the pyramid and claimed that the passage of the Great Pyramid of Giza was 2170 inches and that it was built in 2170 BCE. The significance of this teaching is highlighted by it having over 60 pages devoted, devoted to it in Thy Kingdom Come. The Great Pyramid in Egypt is a witness to all these events of the ages and of our day. Testifying in symbols, the pyramid's downward passage under a draconius symbolizes, of course, sin. Its first ascending passage symbolizes the Jewish age. Its grand gallery symbolizes the gospel age. Its upper step symbolized the approaching period of tribulation and anarchy, judgments upon Christendom, its king's chambers, the divine nature, etc., of the overcoming church, the Christ head and body, its uh, antechamber, the correction and righteousness of the great company, etc., its queen chamber, those of Israel and the world who attain restitution studies in the scriptures series one the divine plan of the ages 1909 edition in notes okay let me uh grab this one here and i'll just finish reading this page pyramid as appearing in studies in the scriptures thy kingdom come and on the cover of studies in the scriptures the Divine Plan of the Ages, 1913 edition, right here. Okay. This is uh, called Chart of the Ages. It's illustrating the plan of God for bringing many sons to glory and his purpose. So we have a dispensation first to the flood. Patriarchal age, Jewish age, from Jacob's death to the end of the 70 weeks. The gospel age, from Jesus' baptism to the completion of the church, which is his body here. And so you can see all these pictures, you know, like parts of the pyramid. You can see the harvest, Masonic age, the reign of Christ. And then the age to come. And this says the harmony of its teachings. Okay. Chart of the ages from studies in the scripture from the divine plan. In a monumental display of deceit, when Russell revised his doctrine to focus more on 1914 than 1874, he updated his pyramid measurements in later editions of Thy Kingdom Come to suit his new interpretation. Russell originally used the size of a pyramid to prove that 1874 A.D. marked the beginning of the period of trouble 
as shown below in the 1891 edition of Thy Kingdom Come. In the uh, 1911 edition of Thy Kingdom Come, Russell changed the pyramid measurements by 41 inches to show that uh, 1914 would be the beginning of the time of trouble. Okay. So Thy Kingdom Come, page 342. This is from the 1891 edition. This is the same page, but from the 1911. Oh, see, the numbers, yeah, see, the numbers have changed. Okay, because see, this says, we find it to be 3416 inches, symbolizing 3416 years from the above date, B.C. 1542. So, yep, they changed. This calculation shows 80... 1874, 1915, as marking the beginning of the period of trouble for 1542 years BC plus, got a different number here from here, plus these many years AD equals, and then you have different number of years here. Thus, the pyramid witnesses that the close of either 1874 or 1914 will be the chronological beginning of the time of trouble, such as was not since there was a nation, no, nor ever shall be afterward. And then here's uh, what the page actually says. Okay, and and you can you can um, full screen this if you want to, you know, compare side by side. Uh, just just pause this video um, so that you can, um, you know, read read all of this. Okay. Okay. Question. We now see no reference to this calculation, but another prophetic proclamation from Daniel 4, amongst other uh, spurious scriptures, to deceive and hide the ori original calculation. How can two out of the three calculations be so different but yet arrive at the same date? Anyone can see that the 2570 is clearly taken from the Great Pyramid of Giza as per the original calculation, but due to the lack of humility and the arrogance that becomes them they hold steadfast to the writings of men remember lest we forget christ was looking at this time and he found that russell's use for this prophetic and fundamental doctrine cornerstone of christ setting up his kingdom in 1914 that he thought russell was pretty clever and had a eureka moment and thought that's my man right there here, thanks to the very accurate measurements of all the passages furnished by Professor Smith, we are enabled to reach what to us are by far the most interesting features of the testimony of this witness yet delivered. Studies in the Scripture Series 3, Thy Kingdom Come, page 338. Okay, Professor Smith found the first of these, these measurements, A, to be 1874 pyramid inches, the second. 1881 pyramid inches and the third 1910 pyramid in, uh, inches thus re thus reduced they would give the dates of a october 1874 b october 1871 and c october 1910 a.d studies in the scripture series three thy kingdom will come okay in the passages of the great pyramid of giza the agreement of one or two measurements with the present truth Chronology might seem accidental, but the correspondency of dozens of measurements prove that the same God designed both pyramid and plan from 1922. And the great pyramid of Egypt standing as a silent and inanimate witness of the Lord is a messenger, and its testimony speaks with great eloquence concerning the divine plan, 1925. 
as stated in the 2015 yearbook, this is not man's work. In the late 19th century, uh, Charles Taze Russell and some of his associates endeavored to reestablish true Christian worship to help them disseminate Bible truth in various languages Zion's Watchtower Tract Society was legally incorporated in 1884 with Brother Russell as president. He was an outstanding student of the Bible, and he fearlessly exposes false such doctrines as the Trinity and the immortality of the soul. He discerned that Christ would return invisibly and that the appointed times of the nations would end in 1914. Luke 21, 24, Brother Russell devoted his time, energy, and money uh, money and sparingly to share these truths with others. Clearly at that pivotal time, Brother Russell was used by Jehovah and the head of the congregation. An outstanding Bible student, he couldn't study French, let alone the Bible. Simply put, deceit and lies. Okay. Although if he were alive today, I'm sure that his whole life and all of his wizardry, magic, and prophetic calculations would have definitely been a sequel to the Da Vinci Code franchise, which he would have welcomed as he was a keen businessman and could see a good return on investment. Okay. Go ahead and read this uh, next chapter, New World Translation in Freddie Franz. It is commonly known the original translators were as follows, Nathan H. Knorr, Frederick W. Franz, Albert D. Schroeder, George Gangus, and Milton Hins- uh, Hinskel, or Henschel. From 1879 until about 1942, the authors of and contributors to various Watchtower publications were clearly identified. That changed with the election of Nathan H. Knorr, as president in 1942. Nor was born 23rd April 1905 and died the 8th of June in 77. He served as president from 42 to 77, the era in which the uh, NWT2 was produced, read 1993, okay? Um, Nor's administration mark an introduction of anonymous publication within the Watchtower organization. Uh, Stewerman offers two reasons for the adoption of this uh, this authorial author, uh, author, authorial to the abbreviation NWT indicates the 1950 edition of the New World Translation of the Christian Greek Scripture unless otherwise noted. Uh, 13, uh, an amenity. Nor's predecessors, Russell from 1879 to 1916 and Rutherford 1917 to 42, were both prolific writers where Knorr, who was not, relied on his vice president, F.W. Franz, for most writing tasks. Anonymity would eliminate comparisons between Knorr and his predecessors. Perhaps Knorr, the president, as the cynical part of me would not like Franz and or others having literary precedence above him, hence he silenced any recognition of the writing committee being highlighted for this work. None of these men had any university education except Brand, who left school after two years, never completing even an undergraduate degree. Brands had stated that he was familiar with not only Hebrew, but with Greek, Latin, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and French for the purpose of biblical translation. In 1954, there was concern for the courts within Scot for the courts within Scotland brought the GB representative to discuss WBTS, and within this manuscript, it is in, it interrogates the validity of the New World Translation based upon the testimony of F. France. Okay. Um, let me read this, uh, and then I will uh, add this to uh, the list of, of links for you guys. 1954, in a Scotland trial, Fred Franz, the head, then head of the Watchtower editorial board, admitted that he himself was the one who had checked the accuracy of the translation and recommended its publication. Okay. The following is from the trial transcript. Question. 
insofar as translation of the Bible itself is undertaken, are you responsible for that? Answer, I have been authorized to examine a translation and determine its accuracy and recommend its acceptance in the form in which it is submitted. Later, Franz was asked about his own involvement in the translating. Okay, um, question. Were you yourself responsible for the translation of the Old Testament? Answer, again, I cannot answer that question. Here under oath, Franz refused to confirm or deny that he was the translator of the Hebrew text. Why wouldn't he say that he did not translate the Old Testament? The court also wondered why and asked. Question, why the secrecy? Answer, because the Committee of Translation wanted it to remain anonymous and not, and not seek any glory or honor at the making of a translation and having any, any names attached thereto. I mean, isn't that convenient? Because, I mean, you, any reliable translation, the name should be on there. You should be able to check their credentials. I mean, would you all agree? At least that's my thinking. Why is it the writers of the New Testament books identify their authorship by their names uh, we know they were not seeking honor. This last question was a great one, as the apostles themselves were highlighted within the scriptures, but none are given any honor. So why should the GB assume or be so complacent as to ex to expect that, that if they included their names, that they would have such honor? I think we are what we are seeing here is false humility especially as please note that yearbooks around this exact year of 1954 clearly highlights the same committee members being stated on the inside covers, so willingly to take credit for a yearbook in that case. In fact, this credit and honor was given right up to 1975. Okay, let me... Grab this here. No, 1975 being one of the failed prophecies had these false prophets stated as the author of the yearbooks. However, 1976 now excludes the names and no names have appeared since. I find that personally strange and the cynical in me would suggest that due to the failed prophecy that they did not want their names now so clearly associated with any publications and now as a collective governing body are now responsible. However, we all know that up to his death in 1977, for a cerebral tumor, he was still the president. So why didn't his name still appear on the said literature until that point? Call me cynical. The fact speaks for themselves. The real reason would be that the translators could not be checked since they had no qualifications and anyone investigating this could not find anyone to assume responsibility for the translation. And as we are now familiar, familiar that they are not spirit directed by the Holy Spirit, they neither had authority from God to translate it either. A shrewd plan indeed to leave out the authors who had never who had neither of the above faucets or qualifications to make an accurate translation of the Christian Greek scriptures. A close, a close source to stated Fred Franz had sufficient knowledge of the Bible languages to attempt translation of this kind. He had studied Greek for two years in the University of Cincinnati, but was only self-taught in Hebrew. Not one of the men had ever studied Greek and wouldn't know the difference between an alpha or an omega. Only three of the five had even finished high school. Of those three, only one went on to college. His name was Frederick Franz, the same man who became the president of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He did begin at the University of of Cincinnati, but only completed two years. He then dropped out of college after the first semester in 1913 because he believed what Russell told him, that Christ was returning in 1914. He does not have even the most basic college degree and certainly does not possess a degree for adv advanced study of the Bible. In fact, outside of the Watchtower Circle, Franz is not recognized by anyone as a scholar. 
To all intents and purposes, the New World Translation is the work of one man, Frederick Franz. Okay, the men who made up the translation committee were self-appointed men lacking any adequate schooling or background in biblical languages, unable to function as Bible translators. Their purpose was not to translate the scripture into a modern version of the Bible, but to justify their their theology to their people and have ammunition against Christianity as it is practiced today. Okay, this is continued under oath at a trial in Scotland. As a Bible scholar, Franz would have to know the Hebrew language. Mr. McMillan, a former leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses, said he is also a scholar of Hebrew. Mr. Franz, under oath in a trial in Scotland, was asked. Okay, this is the Scottish Court of Sessions in November 1954. Here's the question. I think you are able to read and follow the Bible in Hebrew. Answer, yes. The next day, he was put to the test. Could he really follow the Bible in Hebrew? Franz was asked to translate a simple Bible text at Genesis 2-4. Question, I think we come to the name Jehovah in the fourth verse, don't we, of the second chapter of Genesis, page 34, yes. Question, you yourself read and speak Hebrew, do you? Remember, Franz has admitted to this the previous day. Answer, I do not speak Hebrew. The examiner was surprised to hear this. Question, you do not? Answer, no. Question, can you yourself translate that into Hebrew? Answer, which? Question, that fourth verse of the second chapter of Genesis. Answer, you mean here? Question, yes. No, I won't attempt to do that. Now, with his scholastic record and testimony testimony under oath in mind, please reread Franz's claims about himself, which he says, what a blessing it was to study Bible Greek under Professor Arthur Kinsla, under Dr. Joseph Harry, an author of some Greek works. I also studied the classical Greek. I knew that if I wanted to become a Presbyterian clergyman, I had to have a command of Bible Greek. So I furiously applied myself and got passing grades. Excerpts from the trial. Hayden C. Covington was the former lawyer for the Watchtower Society. Question. Is it not vital to speak the truth on religious matters? Answer. It certainly is. Question. You have promulgated. Forgive the word false prophecy. Answer, we have. I do not think we have promulgated false prophecy. There have been statements that were erroneous. That is the way I put it, and mistaken. Okay, question. It was promulgated as a matter which must be believed by all members of Jehovah's Witnesses that the Lord's second coming took place in 1874. And then a short discussion of evidence given by Fred W. Franz about 1874 takes place here. Okay, question. That was the publication of false prophecy? Answer, that was the publication of a false prophecy. It was a false statement or an erroneous statement in fulfillment of a, process, of a prophecy that was false or erroneous. Um, and that has to be believed by the whole of, okay, here's the question, and that has to be believed by the whole of Jehovah's Witnesses? Answer, yes, because you must understand we must have unity. We can't have, we can't, we cannot have disunity with a lot of people going every way. An army is supposed to march and step. Okay, question. Back to the point now. A false prophecy was promulgated. Answer. I agree to that question. It had to be accepted by Jehovah's Witnesses. Answer. That is cor- correct. Question. If a member of Jehovah's Witnesses took the view himself, that that prophecy was wrong and said so. Would he be disfellowshipped? Answer, yes. If he said so and kept on persisting in creating trouble, because if the whole organization believes one thing, even though it be erroneous, and somebody else starts on his own trying to put his ideas across and there is a disunity and trouble, there cannot be harmony, there cannot be marching. Our purpose is to have unity 
And then question unity at all costs. Answer unity at all costs because we believe and are sure that Jehovah God is using our organization, the governing body of our organization, to direct it even though mistakes are made from time to time. Okay, my interjection, folks. Anyone who is a Jehovah's Witness in God's word, a true prophet of God, cannot be wrong once, not once. Okay, a unity based on an enforced acceptance of false prophecy. Answer, that is conceded to be true. Question, and the person who expresses his view as you say that it was wrong and was disfellowshipped would be in breach of the covenant if he was baptized? Answer, that is correct. And as you said yesterday expressly, would be worthy of death? Answer, I think. Question, would you say yes or no? Answer, I will answer yes, unhesitantly. Question, do you call that religion? Answer, it certainly is. Question, do you call that Christianity? Answer, I certainly do. Well, no, it's a... Oh, man. That's from page 345 through 348. Okay. Remember, this is Frederick... Franz, president from 1978 to 1999. Question, can you tell me this? Are these theological publications and semi-monthly uh, periodicals used for the discussion or statements of doctrine? Answer, yes. Are these statements held to be authoritative? Yes. Is their, accept is their acceptance a matter of choice or is it obligatory? on all those who wish to be and remain members of the society. It is uh, obligatory. Okay, page four. Question. Is it for that reason that Jehovah's Witnesses accept without question doctrines and biblical interpretations as expounded by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society through its directors? Yes. In publications both periodical and in book form? Yes. Next page. But I thought you have told us already that an acceptance of the beliefs and facts is compulsory. Yes. And there is no possibility of picking and choosing amongst the facts which you will accept and those which you will reject. It must be taken as a whole. That is right. Each individual must prove it by the scriptures. Accepting the exposition of the scriptures in the manner you have already explained. That is right. Okay, page 38. Am I, am I right that you put what is described as the end of the time of the Gentiles in October 1914? Yes. Is it not the case that Pastor Russell put that date in 1874? No. Is it not the case that he fixed the date prior to 1914? Yes. What date did he fix? The end of the Gentiles times he fixed as 1914. Did he not fix 1874 as some other crucial date? Answer, 1874 used to be understood as the date of Jesus' second coming spiritually. Question, do you say used to be understood? That is right. That was issued as a fact which was to be accepted by all who were Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. But it was a calculation which is no longer accepted by the board of directors of the society. That is correct. So that I am correct, I am just anxious to canvass the position. It becomes the uh, bounden duty of the witness to accept the Smith's calculation. Yes. Okay, question. So that once again, Judge Rutherford preached error. He didn't preach the full roundabout truth of the matter. <clears throat> and that particular, not putting too fine a point on it, what was in error? Answer, he was in error. How was that error corrected? We have had no book given out dealing with that particular phase of the subject. Question, but you haven't stopped publishing the book with that in it? Answer, the book still circulates and is, is a reference work to show that we believed at that time. 
How does one now joining Jehovah's Witnesses and reading the erroneous view of Judge Rutherford's know that it is now regarded as erroneous? Answer, because he keeps up with the latest expositions and the latest publications in bound book form. Question, but there is no latest or recent publication of the society which brings to the notice of the witnesses that that view held by Judge Rutherford is wrong? Answer, the explanations given show that there is a different understanding of the matter today. Whereupon that particular point does the adherent to the society find any enlightenment in the publications that he reads? Must he read all of them to arrive at the fact that upon this one point Judge Rutherford was in error? Answer, it isn't necessary for him to read that Judge Rutherford is in error on that point. What he is interested in is in the present truth. The up-to-date truth, like... Wow. Yesterday's errors cease to be published, do they? Yes, we correct ourselves, but not always expressively. We correct ourselves as it becomes due to make a correction, and if anything is under study, we make no statement of it until we are certain. But one may not assume that Judge Rutherford did not publish until he also was certain. He published only when he was convinced and he withheld publication until he was convinced that he was correct. So so that what is published as the truth today by the society may have to be admitted to be wrong in a few years. We have to wait and see. Oh, man. And in the meantime, the body of Jehovah's Witnesses have been following error. They have been following a misconstruction of the scriptures. Error, well, error. Yeah, the whole thing is error, folks. Wake up. You're in a cult. Wake up. God doesn't make errors. Okay. Am I right that it was at one time forecast that in 1925, Abraham and other prophets would come back to earth? They were expected to come back approximately then, but they did not come back. No, it was published. Was it not to the body of Jehovah's Witnesses that that was expected in 1925? Yes, but that was wrong. Yes, and Judge Rutherford admitted it to the headquarters. Therefore, at baptism, must he know these books? He must understand the purposes of God which are set forth in, in, the, in those books. Question. Set forth in those books and set forth in those books as an interpretation of the Bible. These books give an exposition of the whole scriptures. Question. But an authoritative exposition, they submit the Bible or statements that are therein made and the individual examines the statement and then the scriptures to see that the statement is scripturally supported. He what? He examines the scriptures to see whether the statement is supported by the scriptures. As the apostle says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Okay, note. Does this imply discarding that which is not good if it disagrees with the scripture? The prosecutor seems to seems to have been thinking this, judging by the following questions put to Fran. I understand the position to be, do please correct me if I am wrong, that a member of the Jehovah's Witness must accept as a true, as a true scripture and interpretation what is given in the books I refer to you, but he does not compulsory, compulsory do so. He has given his Christian right of examining the scriptures to confirm that this is scripturally sustained. Okay, note the following on his Christian right. <clears throat> Question, and if he finds that the scripture is not sustained by the books or vice versa, what is he to do? The scripture is there in support of the statement. That is why it is put there. What does a man do if he finds disharmony between the scripture and those books? You will have to find me a man who does find that, then I can answer or he will answer. 
Do you imply that the uh, individual member has the right of reading the books and the Bible and forming his own view as to the proper interpretation of Holy Writ? He comes. Would you say yes or no and then qualify? No. A witness has no alternative, has he, to accept as authoritative and to be obeyed instructions in the watchtower or the informant or awake. He must accept those. Is there any hope of salvation for a man who depends upon his Bible alone when when he is in a situation in the world where he cannot get the tracts and publications of your incorporation? He is dependent on the Bible alone. Will he be able to interpret it truly? No. Boy, isn't that a lie. I think you did say there was no minimum age for baptism. That is except for infants and those who are not mentally able to comprehend the meaning of baptism and its responsibilities. What is covered by the term infants? An infant in arms, baby baptisms with possibly a grandfather standing in for the child. But from the age oft oddling upwards, there is a potential of qualifying for baptism. Yes, under parental instruction. Oh, boy. Oh, man, 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 man. All you need is scripture. You don't need literature written by man to tell you what scripture and scripture alone says. Because, yes, you are to be dependent on scripture alone because God's Holy Spirit will be able to help you interpret it correctly. These are liars and the truth aren't in them. So, all right, uh, next video, we will be getting into uh, Johannes Gerber and the New World Translation, okay? All right, shalom, guys.